welcome to the Good Life Coach Podcast. I am your host, Michelle Lamoureux. The intention of this show is to awaken you to your fullest potential. Join me each week for inspiring interviews to elevate an area of your life, as well as interviews with women entrepreneurs who are creating success on their own terms. Each episode provides actionable tips to guide you to design a life you love. Hey there, and welcome back to the Good Life Coach Podcast. Today on the show, we are talking about how to own your financial future. Now, money is such a loaded topic. We don't talk about it enough, even within our own families. Opportunities are missed to teach our children the value of money and to secure their future. Often it's just a result of people not knowing how to do it for themselves. In addition to this, women, as you know, earn on average... 80 cents for every dollar a man makes. The gap is even wider for women of color, according to a CNN business article published in February of 2018. So here's the thing. If you've ever sat down with a financial advisor in the past, most of the time you are sitting across from a man. And in my opinion, we are often speaking a different language. Since we earn less and live longer than men, I believe it's essential to understand how to own your financial future. So today you'll have a chance to look at your money story. To help us learn more about this important area, I've brought on Hilary Hendershot, who is a certified financial planner and founder of Hendershot Wealth Management, which is a leading financial advisory firm for women, where her mission is to motivate women and their loved ones to be financially empowered. Hillary has been a TEDx speaker and has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, NBC, ABC, Fox, Daily Worth, Forbes, and Investopedia. Hillary was also recognized as a top 40 under 40 entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. And in 2018, Investopedia named her one of the top 100 most influential advisors in the United States. With more than 30 television appearances, she's considered the go-to personal finance expert in Silicon Valley for NBC, where they have nicknamed her the investor's voice of reason. Today, Hillary is going to walk us through her seven-step wealth framework, and all of the show notes from today can be found at thegoodlifecoach.com forward slash 026. So if you haven't been focusing on your financial health, I hope that today sparks a desire to learn more and to take ownership. I believe that to live your full potential, you need to make sure your finances are in order. So on that note, let's get into the show. Hi, Hillary. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is such an important conversation, and I'm so grateful to you for taking the time today to talk to all the women listening about owning our financial future. I think as women, in order to own our power, we have to own our financial future. Um, But before we get started, I thought it would be helpful for them to understand what inspired you to become a financial advisor and specifically for women. Yeah. So to be honest with you, in the beginning of my career, I started in the industry in 1999. So this is my 19th year. And um, I was not inspired to be a financial advisor. I was mentored into the business by my father and his wife. My dad had always wanted me to come into the business and be his business continuation plan. And I thought it was like the most boring thing I could ever have conceived of. He (laughs) used to try to teach me aspects of the business and I would like fall asleep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and I just really, um, my understanding of my role has really evolved since then. I'm glad that I stuck with it for long enough to understand, first of all, once I gained the technical competency, that this business is really about people, that it's about understanding their goals and their values and partnering with them in really valuable ways to help them maximize the chances that they'll achieve the things that are important to them. And I thought it was just a bunch of numbers in the Mm. beginning. So, um, (laughs) and kind of what, you know, a couple things happened that really, um, evolved my understanding of the role. And that is, like I said, you know, my first year in the business was 1999. You may remember that in the year 2000, we had Mm -hmm. a stock market event we now call the tech 
rec. So yeah. the tech rec followed the tech bubble and it was a very emotional a time for a lot of people. My dad's clients were, you know, retired multimillionaires. And so I sat in the room with these people who were before these conversations, like characters to me, they were avatars. Mm. And these people I discovered had very real passions, emotions, concerns, families, values, right? And I got very connected to them. Okay. Yeah. And at the same time, when I looked around me, who's who's successful in the industry that I see? Well, my dad and a bunch of other guys that look just like him. Mm -hmm. And so old white men <laughs> and nothing wrong with that. But I had yeah. a lot of insecurity and I'm thinking, how do I fit in? I'm this... I'm like young looking mid twenties female and who's going to give me a million dollars and mm. let me be their financial advisor. Right. So I think I'm the wrong age and the wrong gender. And, you know, over the next couple of years, I both had my own financial crisis. So it turns out I'm really good at numbers and I understand the stock market, but in my twenties, I was also an overspender. Yeah. So I've got massive amounts of credit card debt and I'm going, what the heck is going on? And I, it really humbled me the turnaround process. So stop stopping the financial bleeding, getting honest with people, um, re resolving the credit card debts by negotiation, losing a condo. I oh, had one of those gosh. yeah, horrible mortgages that went up every month. It was called a negative amortization mortgage. And no one should have ever had those mortgages, let alone, you know, I was also moonlighting as a loan officer at that time. So I sold myself a terrible mortgage. It wow. was just a, a huge catastrophe. So lost the mortgage, lost the condo and obviously my credit score tanked, couldn't borrow money, maxed out credit cards. So had to live on cash for a while. And like, I tell this whole story in my TEDx talk, by the way, and I got really fascinated with money psychology and I figured out what was wrong with my own money wiring and was able to rewire it and um, repay, excuse me, pay off the credit card debt, rebuild the retirement account balances. And at this point, I do own a home in one of the most expensive cities in the world to live in. That's mm. San Jose, California. Yeah. So, And I run a very profitable business. So the recovery for me is complete, but I decided I wanted to give that away. And right around that time, I got involved with this business mastermind that was all women. Mm. And I figured out what it's like to be a woman who is supported by and supporting other women. And I was like, this is it. This is it for me. This is where I belong. This is what mm. I want to do. This is my calling, right? So I really put a stake in the ground. I actually left my father's business to create my own brand. And so here you see me about five years later. <laughs> wow. This is such a good story. And I think it's so important because you said you were great with numbers and yet you were still in debt. And I think this is the issue that we make our money, but we don't know what to do with it a lot of times. And we're not taking care of it and nurturing it the way that we do our families, our children, ourselves. And so I'm actually curious with your 19 years of experience, what do you see as the biggest difference between how men and women manage their money? Yeah. So I never like to make total stereotypes. I mean, obviously there are exceptions to every single rule, but if I'm going to speak broad strokes, yeah. men experience confidence and egoism and maybe some dominance in the area of money, like more money is more domination, right? Like more power, more superiority like that. It's very egoic in my experience. Mm. Um, for women, I think it's a, it's a topic we approach with much hesitancy. Yeah. We um, think either consciously or subconsciously that it's not our job. Dad handled it. Um, mm. And maybe, you know, our daughters in this generation won't have that experience. But, you know, for example, my first job was not at my father's firm and I had a 401k. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand all the statements and the paperwork. I didn't get any of it. And when I left that job, I left that balance and it was maybe $600. Okay. But it, I left that balance for so long out of just being estranged from my own money and like not having ownership or thinking that it mattered that I actually forfeited the account. They actually sucked it back up oh into the God. plan. Yeah. Yeah. Just, <laughs> um, and that's me, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I know, you know, that's still happening out there. So I think women tend to have a lot of fear about the stock market. And I think that subconsciously we also relate to more money and more wealth, like it's masculine, egoic. And mm. so we, 
we eschew it, right? Keep it far from us. Like I, I meet with a lot of women who have high incomes and they are afraid to let, um, or let alone, let's say a widow in her sixties, right? With a couple million dollars, they're afraid to date. They're yeah, afraid to date yeah. because a, it's hard to be with a man who ha- who doesn't have anything when you mm. do have money, and b, they're afraid if he does find out how much you've got that he will find that to be unfeminine, unsexy. So there's like a lot of things that are stacked up against us financially. I mean, they're surmountable, but I think we do definitely start with a disadvantage. Yeah, no, I I love I love what you said, and I completely agree, and I appreciate you saying it's in a broad perspective, because it's true. Some women may be more of the risk taker and can sort of, own. you use the word ownership. You didn't feel like you had ownership. And I love that word. So mm-hmm. maybe feel more ownership over it and then not, but we can learn. And so you're here to teach us today, which I'm so glad um, that I you're am. here. Yes. Thank so, goodness for the passage of time and the ability to make wrongs right, right? Right. And I think, you know, I noted on something I read on your website or uh, one of your podcasts I listened to that money is, you know, kind of a taboo topic. People don't discuss it. And that yeah. that needs to change. Um, yeah. So you coming on and giving us, you have a seven step wealth framework that I'm so excited to dive into. So we can start there. But I think just having the conversations, having a woman talk to another woman about money, uh, something's going to spark some awareness and some curiosity and some action in somebody just from this conversation. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, so mm-hmm. I'm excited to dive in. So wait, let's start with step one. Where do we start? Sure. So what I did was after I had completed my own financial recovery, I looked back and said, how can I make this simple for people? I said, well, what did I do? What's the chronology of how I recovered from Mm. these financial mistakes? And I saw that on the day that I really realized that my financial actions were bankrupt, I had a conversation with myself and I said, okay, it's time to get real. Like we can no longer spin the plates of debt and bad financial behavior because I keep having financial emergencies and these are debilitating to my pride, to my ability to have choice and accountability in life. So so what's going to happen, Hillary? I said, well, if I get really honest with myself, if I keep doing the same things, I'm going to keep having the same results and I'm really not committed to that life. So I'm going to decide right here and now that this is not how my life is going to go. So the first step is really decide. And you know, a lot of people say to me, but I already have decided. And my response is, well, if, if after you say you decided, a new plan of action didn't avail itself to you, Mm. then it wasn't a true decision, okay? Because let's say, for example, you decide to move from California to Texas. Well, if you truly decide, you call your landlord and you Mm -hmm. say, I'm moving out. You book a plane ticket. You book the movers. You maybe look for a job in Texas, right? Like there are a slew of actions that you're actually taking. And we all have the experience of that friend who says, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And there's never any actions that follow. It and you mm-hmm. don't trust that that person has actually made a decision. So you know that if you really make a decision, you're going to take new action in that area. That's the hallmark of a true decision because the word decision has the same root word as the words homicide and genocide, and it means to kill off all the other alternatives. That's what deciding mm-hmm. means. So Again, if you truly decide <laughs> um, to to be wealthy and create your desire, desired vision, that is the first uh, necessary but not sufficient step to declaring and, and fulfilling on your inspired financial future. Okay, so you decide to be wealthy. It's basically decide. this is a an owner. It's a mindset mindset shift to take ownership and to really embody and know that you're going to then get into the action though around making changes because now you're owning that part. You've made that decision. Okay. So then does that take us into the second step? Yep. So the second step is speak. And this entire step is about the important importance of beliefs and words. Beliefs exist in the form of words. Okay. I believe money is scarce or I believe I'll never earn more money or, um, saving money scares me, or the economy is probably going to tank and it's all worthless anyway, right? These all beliefs exist in words. So take a library, take an inventory of the things that you believe about money, 
and the things that you say about money. Mm -hmm. And then part of this step is really replacing the disempowered things that you say about money with empowered things. And it does matter. So I'm not a fan of affirmations. And if you use affirmations and they work for you, that's great. More power to you. For me, it's just a little bit like having icing on a mud cake. It's like, it's still under there. It's still mud. Mm -hmm. right? But if you alter what you actually say about something, I'm not talking about saying things like I'm rich and sexy and perfect and powerful, right? That those are affirmations. I'm talking about replacing. I can't afford that, which is a very disempowered thing to say about money with, let me see how I can get the money for that. Or I'm not going to spend on that, right? Yeah. Both of those are empowered statements about money. They put you in the action position in the sentence. So, and the, the, you know, we could talk about this for a couple of hours, but that's just a little taste of the step that I call speak. It really is important. You're, um, I have trademarked this phrase, the money operating system. Mm. Um, a lot of folks use the term money blocks or money mindset, but specifically the money operating system is the core belief that you have about money. So for me, mine was, there's never enough money. And I also got a little bit of money makes me important mm. or like my income or my assets, those, those numbers measure my worth in the world. So I was spending a massive amount of money trying to convince people that I had worth. Mm. And of course, if you're trying to convince people you have worth, what you think you are is worth less, right? Yeah. So it's a little tricky that, right? So you yeah. have to, it, some of this stuff can get pretty deep and pretty like, wow, we're, it kind of feels like we're in a therapy session. Right. <laughs> well, it ain't about money anymore. I, I think there is a lot of emotional ties to it. So I think there is a, an element of therapy to probably what you do. Um, I And I think this step is critical. So you said a few things that I want to unpack a bit. So empowered statements. And what I heard you talking about was limiting beliefs. So identifying what those limiting beliefs are for yourself, whether that is, I'm not worthy of making a lot of money. I'm not good enough uh, to, you know, make a, a, an income that supports a lifestyle that I desire, whatever that limiting belief is. And I know that you're not into the affirmation, but do you encourage people to at least, um, like you said, switch it to an empowered statement of shifting what's possible? Oh, yeah. I have this whole checklist of disempowered things that I pretty much demand that my clients stop saying about money. This is These are clients in my coaching program. Um, I give them this list. It's like, if you're saying any of these things, stop saying that and instead choose one of these. <laughs> right. Can you give us an example? Because I think this is actually probably one of the most critical steps because, like you said, we not only have our own belief systems around this, but we adopted some from just how we heard our parents speak or our grandparents or what we observed. Even if they were talking one way, how did they act? So this has been something that we've grown up with and it's been, a, it becomes a part of us. Another one is, oh, it, it's, it's not all about the money. It should not be all about the money. So people say this when they're engaged in their career, they're thinking about profitable revenue streams, they're talking about making money and they say things like, um, oh, but it's not all about the money. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I want you to know is that sometimes it is all about the money. That when your mortgage is due, when your property taxes are due, when the credit card statement is due, it's not about anything other than the money. That money is just business and that you have an aspect of your life called the financial aspect of your life, just like you have health and spiritual and um, family, like it is there. And if you're in denial about it or resistance to it, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be a little suffering, okay? Mm -hmm. So instead of what, what you're saying, your you're, you're subconscious is very torn when you say it shouldn't be about the money. You're, you're saying there's part of you that wants to make money because we need money in this economy to live. Mm -hmm. And there's part of you who thinks making money is wrong. Yeah. Okay. So I invite you to replace, it shouldn't be about the money with money is business. And I love business. Ooh, I like right. That. Yeah. Yeah. Business is about producing value. When I make an exchange with a client, she gives me her money. I give her my services. I know I make a massive difference in her life. That if people who work, who work, the p people who work with me absolutely have the opportunity to have true financial peace of mind. And I know that that's value. Right. So I, when it comes to business, it's just about business and I love business. <laughs> yes. Okay. This is good. This is so yeah. good. Okay. So thank you. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, step three. 
Step three is plan. So the first two were very conceptual. You know, like you said, they can feel a little bit like therapy. The third is very tactical, very objective. Okay. So we want to mix the two. I want to engage both sides of your brain because money takes up two sides, two hemispheres. Okay. It's very conceptual, very language based, but it's also very practical. So when, so when I say plan, for example, you wouldn't get in your car and leave to go visit your girlfriend without an address of your destination. You would never do that. That would be ridiculous. You would get in your car and you'd be like, okay, I'm driving in circles around my house. I don't know what to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet for most people, that's how they run their financial life. Okay. So I recommend that you automate your success. I do not like budgets. I don't teach them. I don't think that I think that spending your time deciding how you should spend based on categories like utilities and self-care and gas and clothing is a waste of your time. Mm. I think that you should be able to make choices in the moment and that you should be able to be nimble and change based on new opportunities that present themselves to you. So um, you can divide your spending based on three categories when you made the decision to spend that money. So your overhead, your rents, your insurances, your mortgages, your subscriptions, that is you made those those decisions to spend that money before today. So I call those yesterday's promises. You made those decisions in the past. Mm. And then you have tomorrow's dreams. That's your savings, your short and long-term savings for your next car, for your vacation, for the holiday gifts, and also for your financial freedom. And then for the decisions that you make today in the moment, that's today's fun. So three categories, yesterday, tomorrow, and today. And um, and most people make the mistake of planning their savings mm. based on spending what they want to spend and saving what's left over. So I invite you to win that game by making the saving decisions first and then spending what's left over. So it's a really awesome process to right size your life. I find there's a massive amount of very inefficient spending in most people's lives. So you're mm-hmm. spending on stuff because it's easier just to not say no. Yeah. Um, when in, in reality, it doesn't provide you any joy. I'll give you an example. I found when I was at my brokest, my poorest, that I was spending half my my grocery budget. And you know, for someone who doesn't have high income, that um, groceries are a big part of your budget. And I was spending like half my income, my grocery spending on sauces and condiments. I love hot sauces. <laughs> I, and it sounds ridiculous, like expensive balsamic vinegars and stuff. And um, that I was able to cut that out and, you know, spend on and spend in different ways and more quickly pay off the debt. And it didn't decrease my happiness at all. Mm -hmm. That's just an example. I'm sure there's inefficient spending in your life. You just have to find it. This is so good. Thank you so much. Because now do you see, (laughs) this is why you do what you do. Yeah. This is why you help educate women. And this is why so many, so many of us are sitting with cash because we're afraid to invest (sighs) it. But so this is one of my hot topics. Okay. Woman. (laughs) Well, I think one of your steps is invest. Should we jump there? Do you want to go in the order that it comes? You you take me where we should. Yeah. Sure. Let's put a pin in that for a second. I mean, you've taken the time to go chronologically and I can cover the next two steps pretty quickly before invest. But let me just say BlackRock Financial did a big survey in 2017. They found that of the women who said they had at least $100,000 saved for retirement, 71% of them reported that it was all in cash. And whenever I see large cash balances, especially money that should be part of the retirement portfolio, I know that that is a harbinger of fear. Mm -hmm. I know that that means she is afraid of investing, afraid of losing money and not understanding how to do, how to do, how, how the stock market can be a generator of individual wealth for her. So it's a problem of, it's a chasm of understanding. Okay. So one of my main missions in life is to get women invested in the stock market in low cost, very diversified ways and to keep them invested in accounts titled in their own names. Yes. Yes. I'm all for that. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So great question. So let's circle back to that. Okay. Okay. Good. This is so right. good. Okay. Um, so such an education. Plan, yes. Yeah. So after a plan, the fourth step to wealth is ask. Okay. So now you have your machine built. What we didn't talk about in the plan step is that we're, um, we've built a cash, we've built a net 
net worth maximizer machine by paying your bills every month and funding your savings accounts every month automatically before you even see the money. The only thing that's left in your checking account and your one checking account is the amount you can spend on today's fun. Okay. So it literally is a machine that increases your net worth every month. And now you've got that machine and it increases your net worth at the rate that it increases your net worth. And so now you want to expand the trajectory of that machine. You want to grow it by asking. And there's a million ways to ask. Negotiation is a super hot topic. Obviously, in any business deal, part of part of the proceeds or benefits are going to go to the other person. Part of them are going to go to you. We want you to get your fair share. Um, another way to ask is to ask for a discount or ask for a raise. If you're an entrepreneur, you can increase your prices. Um, you can, uh, you know, for example, I just hired a, a new client services director. Every time she gets on the phone with one of my vendors, she asks for a discount. What can you give us? What kind of deal mm. can you give us? And I didn't even ask her to do that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. It's like, awesome. Wow. And then she comes to me at the end of the week and she tells me, I saved us this much money this week. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> and then it's add that to my bonus at the end of the year. <laughs> exactly. It's very on brand. It's yeah. very, I love it. Right. It's great. Okay. So that's asking. And that's about adopting that principle into your life, making bigger and bigger requests of the world and increasing the value you deliver. Um, okay. So that's step four. Step five is earn. Obviously that's the most fundamental aspect of your financial life, unless you won the lottery or have an inheritance coming, you have to take inspired action to bring income and assets into your financial ecosystem. So um, building a technical skill set so that your wage can increase or figuring out ways to bring more revenue, profitable revenue streams into your business, right? Right. Like whatever that is, mm -hmm. there's a million ways to earn. You can sell what's in your basement. You can do a side hustle. You can drive for Uber. There's like a million ways, but the object is to be someone who earns more and more money over time time. And then, yeah, step six is invest. Invest. Okay. So harness the power of compound returns through a professionally constructed investment portfolio to exponentially build wealth. Okay. So now you have Albert, to define that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So compound returns. So let's, let's start with linear returns. Linear returns are adding two every time. So my money goes from two to four to six to eight to 10 to 12 to 14. Okay. Yeah. That's linear. Yeah. Now exponential two to four, to 16, 16 to 32, 32 to 64, 64 to 128. Those numbers get pretty big pretty fast, right? Yeah. And you're earning exponential returns in the stock market. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's your opportunity to earn exponential returns. Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein said compound returns are the eighth wonder of the world. Poor people pay them in the form of credit card interest rate charges, by the way, mm. and rich people earn them in the form of stock market investments. Okay. okay. So most people, every time I speak in public, I speak to groups of women all over. I mean, I have probably flown to, I'm definitely thrown, flown to all three time zones in the U.S. to speak mm -hmm. to various groups of women. And I, I say, Say to people, okay, we're going to do some word association. I said, what's the first thing you think of when you think of real estate? And they say things like cash flow. They think of financially independent. They think of being a landlord. Okay, so what's the first thing you think of when I say the word stock market? And they go risky, Ponzi scheme, losing money, right? Mm, interesting. This is good. And, yeah, and that could not those real those associations could not be further from the truth as long as you know what to expect mm. and have a good portfolio and interact with it the right ways. In reality, the stock market has been the greatest generator of individual wealth in human history. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I put this slide on the screen that shows the value of an investment. If you put a hundred thousand dollars in the stock market in 1927, mm -hmm. you bought a basket of U S stocks, essentially bought the whole U S stock market in 1927. By the end, by the beginning of 2018, you would have had $622 million. Wow. $622 million. If you had just bought and held that's it. This is right? with the ebbs and flows. This is with the yep. ups and the massive downs. Yep. Yep. And when you look at that growth line, yeah, you can see those what felt like massive ups and downs at the time mm -hmm. look like little blips. They're just little blips. The problem is we as human beings have these cognitive deficiencies called heuristics. And so when we're in it, it feels much bigger than it actually is big picture. We don't think big picture. So do two, do two years of bad returns matter? No, not at all. 
Not at all. Not when all the evidence says if you try to sell out in time getting back in, you're going to make a massive and expensive mistake. Right? You got to so, stay in it to win it. Is that what I'm you hearing? Stay in it to win it, baby. <laughs> you can you can use that. No, I'm teasing. Yeah. No, I will caveat that again. You have to have the right portfolio. Sure. So don't stay in just anything. Of course. But that's the point. Is if you do both, if you get the right portfolio and a, and good advice around it, then you just stay the course. So who should be on your wealth management team then? Yeah. So, I mean, if I were not in the role that I'm in, I would be looking for an independent fiduciary, someone who gets paid only by their clients. So we call ourselves fee only, not fee based, fee only, which means my clients never pay commissions. Mm. So at that point, you know how they get paid. You know that they've taken an oath to protect you. Okay. Mm. So that's a lot. And it may be a surprise to some of you listening that there are lots of financial advisors out there who have not taken an oath to protect you. So how do you Uh, know they have to be? How do you know that they have? mm -hmm. So they'll tell you that they're a fiduciary, but also it will be on their legal disclosure documents. So anybody who contacts my firm gets a copy of what's called my form ADV. You don't need to know what those letters stand for, but they will offer you disclosure documents. And the fact that they're a fee-only fiduciary will be confirmed in that document. Mm. Okay. You have to you have to have a good relationship. Just like if you don't like your doctor, you find a doctor that you can communicate with and talk with. Do you agree with that? Yeah, your financial advisor should be your buddy. And by yeah. the way, there are search tools for independent fee only fiduciaries. You can go to NAPFA, the National Association of Professional Financial Advisors. Um, NAPFA.org. I'm gonna confirm that. Okay. And I'll link everything in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, National Association of Personal Financial Advisors. And uh, there's a search tool there. You'd find me on that search tool because I'm a member of NAPFA. There are other search tools for fee-only fiduciaries, but I think that's the best known one. Okay, so... So by this time, by the time you're investing, obviously you've made it through the hard work. You've built a little bit of a nest egg or maybe even an empire. The important thing now, now that you've built your castle, what do you build around a castle? You build a moat. You protect (laughs) it, okay? (laughs) So the lots and lots of examples of people who build their castle and then destroy it quickly with one decision or five Mm, bad ones, right? mm. So you got to protect your castle. So um, the first is, don't do stupid stuff with your money. Okay. Mm. Don't loan it out. Don't put it at risk. Don't put it all in one thing. Don't give it to your sister. So her husband can start a restaurant. Like just don't do that. Mm. Loan out amounts that you can afford to lose. Sure. No problem. You want to teach your cousin or your kid good financial management skills, give them money you can afford to lose and then create a repayment plan, but don't loan out money. You can't afford to lose. You ask a hundred women, what will you do if someone give you a million dollars and 99 of them will start telling you about all the ways they're going to give it away. Mm. Well, keep it for yourself, right? (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Yeah. Like give it away once you have enough, okay? Mark Zuckerberg created a plan to give away all his billions of dollars during his lifetime. You can do that, but make sure you have enough, okay? Build your wealth first, yes. Yeah, and you need to protect your wealth with insurances. So you need your homeowners, your renters, your health, your auto. If you're a parent, you need life insurance. If you're wealthy, you probably need an umbrella policy. My husband and I have two million each on t- in term life insurance, and we both and we have a two million dollar umbrella policy in place. Okay. Yeah, but you know what's interesting? When it was time to get life insurance, our fiduciary advisor said to get it just on my husband. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? What? Yes. And I uh, said that's bad advice. This a man. It was a man, and I said this yeah. is bad advice. And so. He, I, I loathe that. Okay, so he, and I'm gonna, I'm saying this because other women are gonna go, oh yeah, I got that same advice. So I said to my husband, I said, no, we are getting insurance on my life as well. Like this is crazy. Like I just don't even understand the rationale behind that. It just didn't make sense. So anyway, yeah. we're not with that yeah. advisor anymore, but. Um. (laughs) So look, um, so I, in my practice, I recommend that husband and wife have the same amount of life insurance. Mm -hmm. Um, if the husband, if it's a more traditional relationship, husband is wage earner, even if woman is staying at home Mm -hmm. or, you know, let me not, not include the possibility that you are in a same sex relationship. But, um, so whatever it is, if he dies, you lose the income, but if she dies, you now need a housekeeper, right. a nanny. Yeah. You have to pay for college, yeah. right? Like it's a massive, massive expense that absolutely both husband and wife should be insured. Yep. 
okay, so you validated what I was intuitively <laughs> knowing, but, <laughs> but I didn't listen to him. So I think that's also, you know, you have to, yeah, you got to yeah. trust yourself. You got to kind of know if it doesn't feel right, you can no harm in getting some insurance for yourself. Well, just think about like between my nanny and my housekeeper, I mean, I probably pay, I'm just going to guess $75,000 a year. Sure of it. Yeah, like, of course. That's not an insignificant chunk of change, right. <laughs> you right. know. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning. This is the, the moat is important piece. Yeah, that's it. Those are the seven steps. This and is so brilliant. I I say any story of financial failure you've heard is an example of failure to execute on one or more of these steps. You have to keep them all in place, okay? Um, and so it's about building that skill set. And don't feel bad if you didn't weren't born with the skill set. We learn lots of skill sets, and you know, unfortunately, this stuff isn't taught in school. So you can learn it. And it should be. So yes, but you're right. It hasn't been taught in school. And so you've now just gotten a seven, a beautiful seven step framework. There you um, go. So thank you. Um, I usually ask, and you can tell me, so it's just for the three best tips based um, on your, you know, expertise here. So you've just covered the seven, but I'm wondering if there's three motivating action tips you'd say, just focus on this. Just Yeah. Gym, yeah. Yeah. So first of all, if you're a business owner uh, and you don't have a separate account for your business revenues, go out today and open a separate account. If you're incorporated or have an LLC, you can actually open a quote unquote business account. But if you're not, no problem. Just open a separate checking account and title it for your business. And that's where all your business revenues go. And by the way, if you open up a separate business account for business revenues, you also need another separate business account for business ta for taxes, okay? So now guess what? If you put 25% of everything that comes into your business into that separate taxes account, now tax time is not painful. Mm. And you will thank me when you become a woman who does not have financial emergencies anymore. Mm. So that's one thing if you're a business owner, um, regardless whether you um, uh, own a business or you're a wage earning family or person, Go download your last three state your last three bank statements. Dig into. Hopefully, you can download the transactions. Figure out what is your overhead. What are your lumpy expenses? You can start to plan for these expenses. Most people have financial emergencies all the time. These should not be financial emergencies. You knew the property taxes were going to be due. You knew the quarterly car insurance was coming. You just didn't plan for it. So if you measure them and write them down, you can actually create savings accounts for them or plan for them in, the, in your cash flow so that it's all paid for when the bill comes. Mm. Yeah. So third, uh, so third, let's go back to step number two in the seven steps to wealth is the speak step. Give yourself an hour. Sit down. Take an inventory of the things you say to your uh, say about money. What do you say to yourself? What do you say to your spouse? What do you say to your kids? What do you say to your friends? Right. Just doing that, putting it in black and white on paper, will be probably a profound experience for you. And now you have the alt opportunity to transform the, some of those disempowered things into very empowered things. That alone will change your life. Thank you. This has been this has been so empowering. I feel like I've learned a lot. I know the women listening are going to learn a lot. If they want to dig deeper and learn more about you, where can I direct them? Sure. So if you have room in your podcast lineup and you are interested in a, a financial podcast, check me out at Profit Boss Radio. If you've been listening to the Seven Steps to Wealth framework, you know you can definitely implement this in your own life. There are little masterminds of women around the country doing this on their own. But if you feel and you know that you need that extra amount of coaching and accountability to really get through it, to not get stopped, I am currently offering my once annual 50K Wealth Multiplier Experience Coaching Program where we will collect 10 women and walk you through these seven steps, very done-for-you ways um, over the course of seven months together. You can check that program out at 50kwealthmultiplier.com. That's 50kwealthmultiplier.com. And of course, my main website is just my name, hillaryhendershot.com. Awesome. You've been fantastic. Such a great conversation and one that I hope women will continue to explore and have curiosity around and to really own their financial freedom. So thank you so much. Thanks for a great chat. You're a really great interviewer. 
I loved today's conversation. It's clearly an area that I'm passionate about, but more importantly, I hope that the seven step wealth framework helps you on your financial journey. Will you take a second to share this episode with a friend? I believe that we need to support our fellow sisters with information that helps us all rise. Also, if you've been enjoying this podcast, would you be so generous to take a minute to rate and review the podcast? It helps me know what's resonating with you, and it also helps other women find the show. So thanks again for joining me, and I look forward to reconnecting with you next week. Bye for now.